hi everybody welcome to my youtube channel and in this video uh, we will discuss again the classification of different sort of materials in our previous le uh, lecture we have i have talked about the classification of materials on the basis of their properties and their uh, applications such as metals ceramics composites and polymers that they have a certain range of properties in a, at a particular temperature or in different fields in general you can classify materials into many different types and if we see the broad range they can be classified either as natural materials or synthetic materials if we see the further details natural materials can be organic or inorganic the typical examples of organic materials are wood leather or protein however that clays and stones come under the category of inorganic materials in the synthetic materials they can further classified as bulk materials microporous or micro scale materials or nano scale materials depending upon the dimensions of these materials the bulk materials can be further classified either as amorphous materials and crystalline materials and in today's topic i will discuss these materials in particular crystalline materials so as you all know what a material solid is so anything that can maintain its shape or volume over time is known as solid and in the solid the atoms have been packed together very close to each other in the liquid or gaseous form the atoms or molecules are separated from each other they are not tightly packed however in the solid the atoms have been arranged themselves and packed themselves very tightly the crystalline solids or crystalline materials are those materials in which the atoms has been arranged themselves in a particular order throughout the whole structure however on the other hand the second class which is known as amorphous materials in these materials they lack long range repeating general order if you see this diagram on the left side you can see that the different atoms first they have arranged themselves in a particular pattern and then this pattern continues throughout the structure so it defines a crystalline material structure on the other side we see that all first of all there's no order between a different repeating units and then we don't see any sort of long range repeating structure into the whole material so this is a particular example of amorphous material now the question is how a material can become a crystalline and how it becomes amorphous what is the driving force when you cool down a material from the liquid form from the molten form you, the cooling rate is a major factor that controls the final structure of the material if you cool down at a slow rate so that the, all the atoms have a sufficient time that they can arrange themselves into a particular position or locations and then they can form a long range repeating structure then the resulting material would be a crystalline material however if we cool down the molten the material from the molten form at a very high rate the rapid cooling results that we don't give sufficient time the atoms present into the liquid and then at the end we don't have a long range repeating units so basically the heating the cooling rate defines the end structure either it is crystalline or either it is amorphous material now the question is when we cool down a material from the molten form how a crystalline structure forms I mean from where the process starts or how the nucleation process occurs and the growth so basically the growth process involves the change of phase from its solid form a form its liquid form or the gaseous form at a high temperature into a solid form for instance if you see a container here which is a full of some molten material and we want to convert it into a solid form we have to under go some sort of under cooling that we have to reduce its temperature from molten form to a low temperature or we have to do the super saturation by doing under cooling we will definitely also doing indirectly super saturation as well when we reduce the temperature from the molten form 
then at a certain temperature the concentration increases so much the super saturation increases so much that some sort of nucleation forms into that liquid the nucleation means the form that the atoms come together and form a certain nucleus that X as a substrate for the further growth. Now in this picture you have seen that the nuclei which are in green color some of them have formed on the wall of the container and some of them are formed into the bulk and in the next slides we will see that what are the motivation factors to form them on the wall or within the bulk. After the nucleation the next step is growth and for the growth these nuclei X as a substrate for further growth and atoms from the nuclei come and then attach and then it starts, results into the growth of the different the growth of the whole solid out of this liquid when the temperature is reduced down. Now as I said that the initial nuclei can form either on the walls or in the bulk so this give us the different types of nucleation and the two for types of nucleation are either heterogeneous nucleation or homogeneous nucleation. The heterogeneous nucleation is a type in which the critical size liquid or the nucleus forms onto some impurity surface. This can be any sort of impurity which is present into the molten liquid that X that give us support or X as a substrate in which the atoms can come and then they can form a nuclei or in most of the cases this is a wall of the container or any material in which or any container wall or surface in which the different atoms can come and form this nucleus. On the other hand the other type is called homogeneous nucleation in which the formation of critical size solid takes place by undercooling. So the uh, motivation factor or the driving force for the homogeneous nucleation is undercooling. They don't need a substrate or any sort of surface in which they can grow. In general practice, when we are dealing in, into our real life, the homogeneous nucleation is quite rare because we always have some sort of um, contamination or the walls of the containers in which at which the atoms can come and then they can solve the process of uh, first of all nucleation and then crystal growth so in real application is very rare to form to have the new homogeneous nucleation process as here I said that for the homogeneous or heterogeneous uh, nucleation there should be a critical size solid that has to be formed so the question is what is critical size size solid in order to understand this we should have to understand this particle diagram which associates the energy with the radius of that nuclei. So whatever material we have in the universe, every material has a certain sort of energy, energy associated with it. Higher the energy, the thermodynamically, the less stable that material would be. And every material in this universe wants to reduce ener its energy in order to become more stable. When <clears throat> the material starts to grow there are two sorts of energies associated with them one of one is known as surface energy and other is called bulk free energy and you can find the this the resultant energy by using this equation in which the negative term which is the favorable term that tends to reduce the overall energy is associated with the bulk free energy however the positive term which is an unfavorable term is associated with the surface energy and the overall energy that comes by combining both in the, these type of energies you can find out over here. So initially when the radius increases the overall energy increases and afterwards it reduces. If you see here that when the energy in initially the energy is increasing so initially when the radius grows it is thermodynamically is not a stable process so you have to push it in some way which is under cooling or supersaturation so that you you form that a certain radius and this radius is known as a critical radius if the radius of that nucleus is less than this or smaller than this then it is 
thermodynamically not stable and it's a reversible process and it can re-dissolve into the liquid. So you have to push it in some way that the atoms can come together and they can form a critical size nucleus or radius and then afterwards the next step is the growth and which is you can see that in the growth step the overall energy tend to reduce and it become a thermodynamically stable process. So basically in short that critical radius is the smaller, smallest radius that should be formed in order to form a stable nuclei and afterwards once this critical radius has been obtained then the further growth will take place and the further growth is a thermodynamically stable process and it would result in the reduction of overall energy and it is a reversible process you have seen here also that initially we have monomers into the liquid form and then we by some external external way such as the undercooling they come together and then they form a certain radius or certain nuclei of a critical radius and afterwards the growth takes place at the end i would like to talk about briefly about the single crystal and polycrystalline materials so a, crystal, a single crystal material is the material in which we have indefinite periodicity throughout the material from one end of material to the other end of the material the atoms are arranged in a particular way and we have seen it throughout the material in order to form a single crystalline material you should form only single nuclei from the molten form and then it should grow however on the, the other type which is called a polycrystalline material in which we have a local periodicity of course they are crystalline materials so they should have a crystallinity so and they have a local periodicity over there and these local periodically uh, you can also call them as single crystals or you, they can also call as grains they have been connected with each other with the help of grain boundaries and then these different grains combine together to form a whole solid material for that you should have a more or multiple nuclei initially form and then each nuclei should grow to form a crystal and then these crystals should form the whole solid material that certain advantages and to advantages and disadvantages associated with both of them for example there are particular applications in which we need a single crystal such as we need silicon wafer into the semiconductor industry we need in certain applications for example in turbines we need a single crystal and in there are variety of other applications in which we also need a polycrystal materials because the polycrystal materials have a certain advantages such as the different grains when they are combined together with the grain boundaries these grain boundaries increase the strength of these materials that we will discuss in that into the next lectures that how the grain what the grain boundaries are basically and how they increase the strength of materials so in this lecture basically we uh, cover that the first of all the difference between crystalline and the amorphous material and then how a crystalline material form and how a amorphous material form and then in the crystalline material we have seen into the details the processes of nucleation and the growth and the typically a critical radius which is associated with the nucleation process that a critical radius should be obtained in order to form a stable nuclei in order to ensure the further growth of the material thank you very much and i would like to have your comments if you have any suggestions or if you want me to discuss any particular topic i will try i will try to give my feedback about it but kindly comment if you have any sort of questions thank you very much